Welcome back to this fifth installment of our series on the general linear model. The topic we cover today is multiple regression, predicting one continuous outcome from multiple predictors. You're not learning anything new today, because actually the material we covered last week, ANOVA, or linear regression with one categorical predictor with more than two categories, already was an example of multiple linear regression. The material we cover today differs from last week's material in only one respect. Last week we only looked at a special case where we have multiple regression with several dummy variables that together encode membership of one categorical variable with multiple categories. Today we look at the more general case where you have multiple regression with any number of continuous or categorical predictors. Let's recap all we've learned until now. You previously learned how to use bivariate linear regression to model the difference between two categories and all you have to do is include a dummy variable as the predictor. Then last week we learned how we can incorporate a categorical predictor with three or more categories by expanding the model and including multiple dummy variables that code for membership of the different groups. That model with two dummy variables is also an example of what we call multiple regression. And the definition of multiple regression is just regression with more than one predictor. It answers the question, what is the unique effect of one predictor controlling for the effect of all other predictors? Now, when we were using dummy variables, it didn't make much of a difference that we're looking at the effect of membership of one category controlling for membership of all other categories because group membership is exclusive. If we have one categorical variable with three categories, you are either in category one or in category two or in category three. It's not possible to be in two categories at the same time. If you score one on one of the dummy variables, you score zero on all of the other dummy variables. And therefore it was not necessary to learn about multiple regression when representing group membership using more than one dummy variables. But today we are delving into multiple regression and all that changes is that x1 and x2 are no longer going to be dummy variables with only zero and one values, but we simply replace them with different continuous predictors. So let's examine this regression equation. The individual predicted values for y, y hat sub i, are equal to an intercept plus the regression slope b sub 1 times the individual values on the first predictor x sub 1 plus a slope b sub 2 times the individual values on the second predictor x sub 2. And we can continue expanding this model with as many predictors as we want. So we can keep adding these little building blocks of plus b times x up until k predictors. So we can just keep expanding this regression equation until we get plus bk times xk. How do we interpret the parameters from a multiple regression model? Well, a is still the intercept, but if we have multiple regression, then a is the expected value for an individual who scores zero on all predictors. When we were using dummy variables, that was just the mean value of the reference category, because the reference category scores zero on all dummy variables. But when we are using continuous predictors, this is the expected value for a person who scores zero on all predictors. b sub 1 and b sub 2 are both slopes. There's one slope, b, for every predictor x. So here we have x sub 1 and it gets a slope, b sub 1, and we have x sub 2, that's the second predictor, and it gets a slope, b sub 2. And those slopes, b, tell us how many points y increases if the predictor x goes up by one point while keeping the values on all other predictors the same. So how many points does y go up if one predictor increases by a point and all other predictors stay the same? So the goal of multiple regression is to predict one dependent variable y from multiple predictors x1, x2 until xk with a linear model and that model would look like this. 
So the individual values of y are equal to some intercept, and we often call this intercept b sub 0 in multiple regression, plus b sub 1 times x1, plus b sub 2 times x2, plus etc., until b sub k times x sub k, so that's if we have k predictors, that's the last predictor, plus the individual prediction errors epsilon sub i. And this regression equation will give us the unique, also known as the partial effect of each predictor while keeping all other variables constant. So that describes the interpretation that I explained here. B tells us how many points y increases if x goes up by 1 while keeping all other x values equal. I find that Venn diagrams are a supremely useful tool to explain how multiple regression works. So with that in mind, let me tell you a story of bubbles. These are two bubbles, and these two bubbles represent the variance in two variables. On the left, father involvement, represented by the white circle, and we have hours worked, represented by the gray circle. These circles represent the total variance in those two variables. It's easy to imagine that father involvement and hours worked tend to co-vary, because if the father works more hours, then he has fewer hours available to spend with his child. So hours worked will take a bite out of the pie for involvement with the child. So visually, this is represented by overlap in the circles. So I've labeled all of the areas in this Venn diagram and the covariance between hours worked and hours involved with a child is represented by the overlapping area labeled C. As you learned in previous lectures, we can describe this overlap as a correlation. If we don't have a theory about the direction of the effect between hours worked and hours involved with the child, then we may choose to use correlation analysis to report on how strongly these variables are associated without making any assumptions about which causes which. Or we could represent it as a regression coefficient. For example, if we have a theory that hours worked, influences the number of hours a father is involved with his child, then we could represent the same covariance as a regression coefficient. But now let's say that there is a third variable, gender role attitudes, how progressive a father is about the distribution of tasks in child rearing. And we can assume that gender role attitudes also co-varies with involvement with the child. So there would also be overlap between those circles. And again, this area labeled C represents the covariance between gender role attitudes and involvement with the child. Multiple regression can be visualized by putting all of those bubbles together. So imagine that hours worked and gender role attitudes both covary with hours of involvement with the child, and they also covary with one another. For example, maybe progressive fathers tend to work fewer hours to make time available to be involved with the child rearing. So what we see here is that the gray circle representing gender role attitudes and the blue circle representing hours worked are both predictors and the white circle is the outcome involvement with the child. And we see that hours worked shares covariance with involvement and gender role attitudes share covariance with involvement, but these two predictors also share covariance with one another. In this picture, the area E plus G, so the total covariance between hours worked and involvement, would be the effect that we would get out of bivariate regression analysis with only hours worked and involvement. And the area indicated by G and D would be the total effect of gender role attitudes that we would obtain if we conducted a bivariate linear regression analysis with only gender role attitudes and involvement. If we do multiple regression analysis, however, we get the effect of each of these predictors controlling for the other predictor. That means we leave out the part that overlaps between both predictors, which is here labeled as G. So if we conduct multiple regression, we include both predictors in one model and we get their unique effects. So the unique effects of hours worked on involvement is represented by the area labeled E, and the unique effect of gender role attitudes on involvement is labeled by the area labeled, is indicated by the area labeled D.
And both of these effects are controlled for the overlapping part g. So how is this reflected in the model coefficients? So here we have a bivariate regression analysis with only hours worked as a predictor, and it has a slight positive effect on involvement with the child, which is significant. And here we have the results of a bivariate regression analysis with only gender roles as predictor, and it has a large positive effect on involvement with the child, which is also significant. But if we include both predictors in one multiple regression model, then we get the unique effect of work hours controlled for the effect of gender roles, and we get the unique effect of gender roles controlled for the effect of work hours. And now we see that the partial effect or the unique effect of work hours is even smaller and not significant, whereas the effect of gender roles is still significant. So we can conclude that after controlling for the effect of gender roles, the effect of work hours is not significant. In other words, this area E is very small and is not significant, and this area D is large enough to be significant. So why is work hours significant on its own, but not significant when we add gender roles? Well, because the model that only includes work hours looks at the significance of area E plus G. So the area G must be large enough to make the sum of these two areas significant. Whereas the multiple regression only looks at the area E and apparently that is so small on its own that it's not significant. We can also look at the difference between separate bivariate regression models and one multiple regression model by plotting them in scatter plots. So here on the left we have a scatter plot of work hours against involvement, and here on the right we have a scatter plot of gender role against involvement, and the blue lines indicate the bivariate linear regression analysis of the outcome involvement on the predictor which is on the x-axis here. So we see a slight positive effect in the left plot and a strong positive effect in the right plot. And these are two separate bivariate regression models. And then these are the plots corresponding to a multiple regression analysis. So here we see a regression line for the effect of work hours controlling for gender roles. And here we see the effect of gender roles controlling for the effect of work hours. And there's one really silly thing that I want to draw your attention to, which is that the regression line is no longer exactly in the middle of the data cloud. When we just conducted bivariate linear regression analysis, the regression line was perfectly in the middle of the data here and perfectly in the middle of the data here. But as soon as we conducted multiple linear regression, this regression line appears to be somewhat lower than the average of the data, and this regression line appears to be somewhat higher than the average of the data. Why is this the case? Well, that's because this regression model gives us the regression line for people who scored zero on gender roles, and this regression line gives us the effect of gender roles for people who scored zero on hours worked. So when we are conducting multiple regression, this slope is the slope for people who scored zero on this predictor, and this slope is the slope for people who scored zero on that predictor. So the lines are no longer in the middle of the data cloud because the effect of work hours is controlled for the effect of gender role and vice versa. And it is clearer to visualize what happens when we use a 3D plot. So here is that 3D plot. This is a three-dimensional representation of multiple regression with the same data. So we see that our predictor work hours is on the x-axis here, and our predictor gender role is on the z-axis, and our outcome involvement is on the y-axis. And we can see that the regression model is no longer a line, but a flat surface in three-dimensional space. And the line for the effect of work hours that we were looking at is basically an intersection of that plane, and the effect of gender roles is an intersection of that plane from another angle that looks like this. And then the effect of work hours that we observed is the value of the effect of work hours for people who scored zero on gender role attitudes. And since that was a variable with one to seven answer categories, nobody actually scored zero on this variable. So 
the regression line of work hours would be about here for people who scored zero on gender roles. And the effect of gender roles that we observed is the effect of gender roles for people who scored zero on work hours. So those are these people here. Obviously, the interpretation of coefficients becomes a little bit more difficult when we use multiple regression. For example, we saw that we obtained the effect of work hours for someone who scored a zero on the predictor gender role attitudes, but gender role attitudes was a categorical scale with values only between one and seven, so nobody actually scored zero on that variable. So our effects become less meaningful. And we can make sure that we get meaningful coefficients out of our multiple regression by centering our predictors before we conduct the analysis. So what is centering? So the problem is as follows. In the regression model, for example, the intercept gives us the expected value when all predictors are equal to zero. But almost nobody works zero hours and absolutely nobody scores zero on the one to seven point Likert scale for gender role attitudes. It's impossible to score zero on that variable. So the solution is to move the zero point to a more meaningful point. So what we see in this graph is the original distribution of gender role attitudes in dashed lines. So we see that the original distribution went from one up until seven, with most people scoring around four points. And what we could do is to just pick up this whole distribution and slide it over to the left to make the zero point equal to the mean value. So now the zero point means someone with an average score on gender role attitudes. How do we center a variable? Well, we center the variable y sub i by taking the individual scores on y sub i and subtracting the mean value. So a centered variable is calculated by taking the original observations and subtracting the mean value. What this does is it changes the zero point, And if you subtract the mean, then the mean becomes the new zero point. After centering, the separate plots from our multiple regression model look like this. So now we see that both of these lines are beautifully in the middle of the data again. And that corresponds to intersecting that three-dimensional plot at the average value of the other predictor. So to recap, by centering, you can choose a meaningful zero point for your predictors. The most common value to use is the mean value, but in future lectures, we will also center around other values. So when do we use multiple regression? Well, one use case is to make better predictions of our outcome variables using all available predictors. So this is interesting, for example, if we are just interested in forecasting sales and we have a lot of different predictors, we can use all of those predictors to make better predictions. And in this case, we don't actually care about the substantive interpretation of the model, we just want to improve our predictions. Another possible use case is to compare the relative importance of different predictors. And this is useful when we have several potential causes of one outcome, and we want to know which of those causes is more influential. Another potential use case is to compare the relative predictive importance of different predictors, and for this purpose, we would use the standardized regression coefficient. Another use case is when we have a theory that implies multiple causes and all those causes should be represented in the model. And a final use case is to improve our causal inferences, so the conclusions that we draw about the effect of one predictor, by controlling for confounders of its effect. And I will explain this use case and these use cases in more detail now. So first of all, let's look at standardized regression coefficients in the context of multiple linear regression. We use standardized regression coefficients to solve one of two problems. One problem is we want to know the relative importance of different predictors. And another potential problem is that we want to compare the effect of the same variable across two studies, but it was measured on a different scale. For both of these problems, the solution is to standardize the regression coefficient to make them approximately comparable. What is a standardized regression coefficient? Well, you actually learned about it already in the context of bivariate linear regression, 
And there I explained that we would get the standardized regression coefficient by conducting regression on the standardized predictor and outcome. So instead of just using predictor X and outcome Y, we use Z scores of the predictor X and outcome Y. And to get the Z score of X, we just take the individual values of X minus the mean of X and divide by the standard deviation of X. And to get the Z score of Y, we take individual values of Y minus the mean of Y and divide by the standard deviation of Y. And a property of these Z scores is that by subtracting the mean, the Z score has a mean of zero. And by dividing by the standard deviation, the Z score has a standard deviation of one. And in doing so, the Z score loses the original units of a variable. So if the original variable was expressed in points on a Likert scale, after we compute the Z score, the units are standard deviations of the original variable. So a Z score of 1.3 means that a person scored 1.3 standard deviations above the mean. What is the difference in interpretation between the unstandardized regression coefficients and the standardized regression coefficients? An unstandardized regression coefficient tells you that a one point increase in a predictor X is associated with a B point increase in the dependent variable Y. But the standardized regression coefficient tells you that a one standard deviation increase in X is associated with a beta standard deviation increase in the dependent variable Y. And when we're talking about multiple regression analysis, we have to add the following. A one point increase in X is associated with a B point increase in Y, controlling for all other predictors. And for the standardized regression coefficient, a one standard deviation increase in X is associated with a beta standard deviation increase in Y, controlling for all other predictors. So how do you choose when to use the unstandardized versus the standardized regression coefficients? Well, you can use unstandardized regression coefficients if the units of the original variable are meaningful or important. For example, we can all interpret something that is measured in years or in euros or dollars or in centimeters or number of questions, correct? So if these are your units, those are pretty meaningful and you might want to report the unstandardized regression coefficients. Another use case is if you are working with an outcome variable that has, for example, clinical cutoff scores. For example, a predicted value of 60 or higher corresponds to a clinical diagnosis of being depressed. In this case, also you want to use the unstandardized regression coefficients so that readers of your paper can calculate the predicted score and compare it to the clinical cutoff scores. By contrast, we use standardized regression coefficients when the units are not meaningful. For example, when we used Likert scales to measure something or when we have an abstract concept like job satisfaction or need to belong with no meaningful scale and no clinical cutoff scores. And another use case of the standardized regression coefficients is if you want to compare effect sizes of different predictors, because the standardized regression coefficients can be, import, can be interpreted as a measure of relative variable importance. One thing that you want to be acutely aware of when you're conducting multiple linear regression is multicollinearity. The problem is that multiple regression gives us the unique effect of each predictor controlling for all other predictors. But what if those predictors overlap substantially? For example, imagine what would happen if I predicted the total body length from the length of people's left leg and the length of people's right leg. Well, let's think this through. It's definitely possible to predict body length from leg length because taller people tend to have longer legs. But legs are also approximately equally long, give and take measurement error and very slight deviations. And they probably both predict body length equally strongly. So their effects are going to overlap nearly 100%. So if you think about this bubble plot, the blue bubble would be the left leg and the gray bubble would be the right leg. Both of them have substantial overlap with the outcome body length, but their effects are almost completely overlapping. In other words, 
the area labeled G would be very large and the unique effect, the areas E and D, would be extremely small relative to the area G. In other words, left leg does not really have a unique effect on total body length after controlling for the right leg or vice versa. So let's just analyze some data where we predict people's total body length based on the length of their left leg and their right leg. This is the coefficients table of that analysis. And what we see is that the intercept is 121.55 and the unique effect of the left leg controlling for the right leg is minus 0.04 and not significant. And the unique effect of the right leg is plus 0.67 and also not significant. So what conclusion should we draw here? Neither the length of the left leg nor of the right leg has an effect on total body length? No, that's not quite right. Neither of them has a unique effect on total body length after controlling for the effect of the other. But what happens if we use only one leg as predictor of total body length? In this case, we use the left leg. Then we find a positive effect on total body length, which is significant a completely different conclusion than we would have drawn here. And I bet that if we only used the right leg as predictor, we would observe a very similar effect size and also a significant p-value. So this problem is called multicollinearity, and it occurs any time when two or more predictors explain the same variance in the outcome variable. How can you diagnose multicollinearity? Well, if you only have two predictors, as in the leg length example, then you can simply examine their correlation. For example, a correlation of 0.8 or 0.9 might indicate a problem. That's a very high correlation if you remember your rules of thumb for interpreting the size of correlation coefficients. But with more than two predictors, we can't just use the correlation coefficient, because the correlation tells you how strongly each pair is associated, but it's also possible for more than two variables to share variance altogether. In other words, you need a measure of multiple correlation between more than two variables, and that measure is just the R-square or explained variance. So how do we calculate this for the predictors? Well, for every predictor P, we calculate a regression analysis predicting its value from all other predictors. Then we get the R-square for that regression model. It is common to transform this R-squared into the variance inflation factor, also called the VIF. And when people discuss multicollinearity, you will often see the VIF reported. What are some of the causes of multicollinearity? Well, we already examined one example with the left and the right leg which is that several of your variables essentially measure the same thing. So left and right leg is an example of this, but also father's socioeconomic status and mother's socioeconomic status may also kind of measure the same thing because of assortative mating. But also, for example, emotion regulation is probably very similar to neuroticism, so those might be multicollinear. Or, for example, Multiple brain regions might be jointly activated and therefore be multicollinear. But another reason could be that you have a very small data set with very few unique values and therefore values of several predictors tend to go hand in hand. To understand the problem here, consider the most extreme example. You have only two participants and only two categorical predictors. Let's say that person one is Dutch and has a tattoo and person two is international and has no tattoo. In this example, the variables nationality and tattoo are perfectly collinear. If you know someone's value for tattoo, you also know their ethnicity. That person is Dutch. And if you know someone's ethnicity, let's say the person is international, you also know that they don't have a tattoo because there are only two people and only two categorical predictors, and their answers go perfectly hand in hand. So of course this is a very extreme example, but a similar problem tends to occur in other small data sets with many predictors. What are the consequences of multicollinearity? Well, one consequence is that the estimates of unique effects of collinear predictors tend to be biased. 
and we already saw an example of this in our analysis of leg length. And what can happen is that the coefficients may be smaller than they would have been in bivariate regression, or larger than they would have been, or they could change sign. So for example, if we look at leg length, in multiple regression with these collinear predictors, the effect of left leg became negative, and the effect of right leg became somewhat stronger than it really should have been. And if we compare that to bivariate regression, we see that the effect of left leg was actually positive. So we get a very biased estimate here and the sign flipped. Another consequence of multicollinearity can be that the standard errors for the unique effect become inflated. And this means that the algorithm has great uncertainty about whether or not this is the correct parameter estimate. So let's look at leg length. Indeed, here we see an effect of minus 0.04, with a standard error almost 10 times as large as the effect itself. And if we compare that to the bivariate regression analysis, we get an effect of 0.58, with a standard error almost four times as small as the effect size. So this standard error is certainly inflated. But it's also important to know that multicollinearity has no influence on the model's predictive ability. The R-square remains unaffected. In other words, only the parameter estimates are biased, but not the overall model predictions. So I could probably predict people's total body length very well from this model, maybe even better than from this model, even though the coefficients of this model are uninterpretable. Now that you have a basic understanding of multiple regression, I recommend you try it yourself using the tutorial exercises. Please note that this is not all of the material we'll cover this week. There's another lecture video about causality. This is more of a philosophical topic, but it's extremely important for the inferences we draw from our multiple regression models. Enjoy that video and see you next time.